I'm here with Phyllis Greenberger, President and CEO of the Society for Women's Health Research in her office downtown Washington, D.C., and the date today is March 14, 2011. Phyllis, thank you for uh, agreeing to participate. I'd like to start with your, with your childhood, if you could talk about where you grew up and a little bit about your family background. I grew up in Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Um, family background, well, my, my uh, grandparents were from Russia, and they emigrated when they were, um, I guess, in their teens or 20s. Um, so we don't go back much further than that. And my grandfather, my, my grandparents on my father's side um, came from Poland, from Krakow. And I did not, I knew my, my mother's parents, my grandparents, but I did not know my father's parents. They were both dead before I was born. And was your neighborhood a Jewish neighborhood? Well, Brooklyn, you know, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of Jews, famous Jews actually come from Brooklyn. I, I don't know that it was exceptionally so, but they certainly, certainly never felt like a minority. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were enough Jews there and certainly in the schools I went to. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't a religious area. Actually, the area that I lived in when I was in high school, um, Midwood, became actually very religious shortly after we moved out. Um, but not for that reason, it just happenstance. So it actually, and I think it continues to be a very religious area. There's a yeshiva there, um, and a very vibrant Jewish community there now. What kind of religious education did you have? I went to Hebrew school, um, and Sunday school, at Temple Beth Emmeth, um, was on Nostrand Avenue, I believe. Um, and those days, it was a long time ago. I don't think girls really got bat mitzvahed. I was confirmed, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and pretty much stopped going. You know, like most of us did, I guess uh, then. But and and we weren't. You know, we weren't a religious family. We're still not a religious family. But we adhere to the traditions very seriously and celebrate them all. Um, and I think being Jewish is important to us, not necessarily as I said as a religion, but more as a tradition and just um, an identity. So when, when you say you're not, you're not religious, you mean you're not religiously observant of going to shul on right. weekly? Right, we don't go to shul. Okay. We've become a little bit more religious. I have two um, daughter-in-laws who, who converted before they married, two of my sons, and all of my grandchildren now go to religious school. And so we're backlighting the candles and doing all that stuff because all the little kids now say, all know the prayers. And of course, since my daughter-in-laws went through the whole process of conversion, we get a, and actually one of them builds a sukkah every year. So we're actually getting a little bit more religious as time goes on. Do you reflect on um, maybe Jewish values that were transmitted to you as a, as a young girl? Yeah, I think, well, I just think there's something special about being Jewish. Um, about heritage, about the traditions, um, about the types of people, and also, apparently not politically correct, but I think Jewish people are generally very intelligent um, and ambitious and um, uh, and achieving, and I and I think that that combined with with our history, um, the fact that we've withstood quite a number of. Uh, Difficulties over the years. Um, I, I, I think there's a very there's a very strong sort of connection um, between Jews wherever they are, um, and I've discovered that actually in uh, well, in, in India. But um, uh, we uh, years ago, my sister was uh, she works at the State Department, and uh, we visited her in, in Tunisia and went to a temple there and went to a Friday night dinner um, with Tunisians, Jewish Tunisians, and it just felt like you were at home. You know? Is it surprise you that, that uh, Judaism has maybe become more meaningful to you at, at this stage in your life? Well, I think part of it has to do with the, with the daughter-in-laws who have converted, and so, um, you know, and, and so we more sort of in touch with with Judaism, but but I think as you get older, you do. Um, again, not as um, I'm just very proud, you know, proud of being Jewish, proud of um, uh, of our history, and I've read a lot more of it uh, about it. You know, and frankly, all the things we were blamed for, from the you know the Inquisition to the plagues and everything else, and so it's just um, and it's interesting 
that, um, that Jews sort of pop up almost wherever you look, whether it's way back in Obama's family or Hillary's family, or if you look far enough, you'll you know, find them. I think it's just interesting. Okay, interesting. Um, I'll ask you a little later in the interview about how you feel that your being Jewish has played a role in your professional life. Um, but let's get back to your, um, your earlier years. And where did you go to college? Syracuse. Okay. And then I know you, you, your first degree was as a social worker. Yeah. At your first job. Um, how did you select that as a, a, a career? Well, I actually was very, always very interested in psychology. And, um, and thought that I wanted to be a psychologist. Uh, and, um, and actually ended up going to social work for very um, practical reasons. I had three little children under the age of six. And um, I was told, and I, that may be different now because it's been a number of years, that the, the only good psych psychology program was in Baltimore. I guess it, um, maybe it was at Hopkins, I guess. And I just didn't see how I could go to school and, and travel back and forth. Um, you had a busy with, husband? With the three kids. And yeah, at the time he was, well, he was working for the Wall Street Journal and I think he was covering foreign policy at the time. So he was traveling a lot. Um, the other thing is that I was told that unless you wanted to do research, that you could essentially, you could practice as a therapist with a social work degree. You didn't need to get a PhD. And so I thought, well, you know, I could start with this and, and then go from there. But then, and I, um, but then shortly after I, I got my, my master's degree, I decided to go into policy instead. So it was just as well that I didn't spend the extra time and years getting a PhD. Yes. Social work is traditionally a, a career that's selected by women. Yes, it is. Um, and um, were you feeling any kind of um, influence of the feminist movement at this time? Well, I don't think so. You know, it's funny. I, I actually, um, uh, I don't know that I, that I did consciously, but when I decided to go into, well, I got my, I got a couple, I had to, you had to get a couple of internships, you know, during, during the, um, the course of the, of the curriculum. And I did, um, my first internship actually was at Lutheran Social Services with a, 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 a adopting children, a child adoption. Uh, and then I started working with the American Psychiatric Association. And, and I've been asked this a lot of times, and I, I can't say I consciously consider myself a feminist, but as soon as I got there, almost, I basically pointed out that they were doing nothing on women's issues. They weren't involved in the ERA or any psychological issues affecting women, and that I thought we should be, and of course, ultimately, I became very involved in all the women's psychiatric issues, got friendly with all the women psychiatrists, um, and actually ran for the, well, it, I, I convinced them to start a political action committee, and then I funded mostly women on the Hill when people really didn't fund women. And uh, actually, a lot of the women, including Nancy Pelosi, and some of the ones that are actually in high positions now, are the ones that I funded when they first started running. When you say you funded them, you mean your organization them, made I made we I, I, to their... I decided mm -hmm. to give them you know to give them money so that they could run. So even though I I don't remember ever sort of consciously thinking about you know feminism, but it but it certainly occurred to me that that they weren't doing anything on women's issues, and I felt strongly about getting women into the House and Senate, so somewhere it came from. And if someone were to ask you today if you're a feminist, how would you, how do you answer that? It depends on the definition of feminist. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, I think that women, well, I don't think that women have to work. I think they should work if they want, if they can. I think they should get the same amount of respect and salary as, as men do. Um, um, I do think I mean, I, you know, there's, it's interesting, uh, there have been articles recently about how sort of women are taking over, sort of the stronger, uh, you know, of the couple. And I'm invited to a conference in April where a group of people are getting together to sort of 
pound their chests on the fact of what's happened to all the men and why are boys sort of falling behind in education and stuff. So I think it's sort of interesting the way those are the kind of meetings we they had years ago, you know, on women and now they're having them on men. I don't know how much reality there is to that, but there's but women certainly have become much more um, assertive and um, ambitious and stronger. And take the are the majority in many of the professional schools at right. at this point. Right. Downside is that they're not getting you know, there's still not that many women CEOs or women on boards, um, law partners mm -hmm. or uh, heads of medical schools. I mean, you can count them on hand. So while they're, they're ahead in the educational achievements and numbers, um, they're still not up there in the numbers in terms of the, height, you know, the heights of their careers. Can you talk a little bit about the work and home balance when you were raising your family? Well, I've been asked about that a lot. I got a lot of grief once when I was interviewed for a book a while ago saying that you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. And there were a lot of women that said, oh, that's not true, you know, you can work. And I don't, look, you can work and have a family, but something's got to give on both sides. You cannot be a law partner and never see your kids and think they're going to be fine. Um, I was very lucky. It was, there was, the, the pressure was much less on a woman to work because this was a long time ago. It was something that I wanted. My mother worked, my sister had a career, and so it just seemed natural to me that I would as well. But, um, but I, you know, I went to school part time, and then my first job was manageable, and I had full time help, which, and they, you could afford it then. It was very inexpensive, um, and so as my job. And then I changed. Obviously, then I started with the um, uh, with the society. As my job responsibilities got greater, my hours longer. The kids were older, mm -hmm. um, and so it worked out. Frankly, I didn't plan it that way, but it worked out very well. I see what my daughter-in-laws are going through now, and I just, you know, I think it's incredibly stressful and um, and not healthy actually for them or the kids. Um, it's just too it's much. Hard to find the perfect. Mm -hmm. Balance. When in in your home growing up, you you have one sister. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, what was the atmosphere like in terms of in, encouraging girls to be to do what they wanted to do, or to, w was there an expectation that you would have a career? I don't think that there was. My mother, I think, for financial reasons, um, but my mother actually went back to college um, when we were young. She went to Brooklyn College, and then um, I think my father's business wasn't doing so well and then she ended up working for city housing so um, which is very lucky because she's 92 and she still gets a pension from them which is why the state's going bankrupt but <laughs> anyway, I'm glad she still gets not much but in, in New York City yeah uh -huh. not much but it helps um, uh, I, you know, I think part of the role model might have been my sister. My I, I, I sister. Um, is she older? Yeah, she's four years older, and she. I don't know if she ever finished her doctorate. I know she has her master's, and I think she started her doctorate. But then she was working, um, started working for the State Department, Dennis Public House, and uh, and and so I, I guess between my mother working and my sister working just always assume that I would work. And I knew that I wanted a career. I didn't want a job, I wanted a career. Mm -hmm. Where do you think your self-confidence comes from? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question because I was not self-confident. You know, my, my Bob, my husband, um, sort of kids me when, when I, we first started dating. You know, his friends thought I was so quiet and shy and everything, and I think I was. Um, I'm not quite sure. I sure changed a lot. Um, I'm maybe too outspoken and, and very sort of opinionated, um, and I'm really sort of nothing really. Sort of, you know, I mean, I can talk to anybody about anything, and I'm not intimidated at all. And I'm, part of that has to do with just growing older and being more sure of yourself and also not caring as, as much, you know. But. Uh, and I work with a lot of, you know, right now I'm working with a lot of doctors, a lot of strong, intelligent, um, successful women. 
So I'm surrounded by women who are very successful and intelligent. Do you think being in Washington is uh, an environment that um, nurtures this type of um, development for, for women? I think it does. I think, you know, I don't know how to compare it to, um, I don't like the financial, um, uh, you know, arena in, in New York. Since, but, but here, I mean, you have a lot of very strong women who are, you know, whether they're lobbyists on the Hill, mm -hmm. um, lawyers. So, you know, I don't think as a woman that anybody would feel that they're sort of a second-class citizen mm -hmm. here. You probably, there are probably as many strong, powerful women as there are men, mm -hmm. maybe more. Now, ra raising your boys, your, your three boys, um, you were the only female in your mm -hmm. in your house. Uh, was was it? Did you make a conscious effort to? Uh, obviously, you're a work, working mother, which is a, a role model for them. But did you make a conscious effort to transmit gender neutral values to them, for example? Well, I don't know about gender neutral. Um, I mean, I, I was, you know, I consider myself having a strong personality, and I, I think I, and I did then. Maybe not as strong as it is now, but I think, um, you know, I've had a fair number of achievements in my life, and they know about it. They, I just came across some photographs. I'm trying to clean out my stuff. Um, you know. Three little ones sitting there. Well, I'm sitting there with my graduation hat when I, you know, got my masters and everything. So you know, they could see mom's, you know, graduating, getting her masters, and so that, you know, they were aware. Um, and of course, as they grew older, with some with some of my achievements. Um, but I think, and I, but I also, I taught them manners towards women. You know, pulling out the chair, opening the door, things like that. Um, I think that's important. I think we're not the same. I think you know, men and men women, and women, yeah, and men and women are not the same, mm -hmm. and that women still there should be a certain deference, in spite of the fact that they may be as powerful or as strong. There's still, and I, maybe that's old-fashioned, but they still do it, and I still like it. You, you're talking about kind of societal courtesies, yeah, that, that kind of, thing. and also, but they, and they, they. Um, you know, I taught them how to do the laundry early on. I wasn't doing the laundry every time somebody came back from practice. Um, they, when the housekeeper finally left, um, you know, I made dinner, they did the dishes. Um, my daughters in law are very grateful for the good training that they had. Um, so I guess that was sort of gender neutral. I mean, there was, you know, I was working, you know, we all had to share, we all had to take part, and do, they did. Yeah. Do they articulate any or express their sense of how they were raised or, or even venture um, an opinion about what you do now in, in terms of seeking parity for women and, and men in research? Well, I think they're proud of me. Um, you know, they know they've come to, I've gotten, some, you know, several awards and, and they've come to those ceremonies. Of course, they've seen the magazines that I'm, that I'm in, so I think they have certainly an appreciation for, um, you know, my accomplishments. Um, I'd like to talk now about the, the growth of, of, or the development of um, your professional uh, focus, the Society for Women's Health Research, which um, I'll let you explain what it, what it is. Go ahead. Well, the mission is to improve the health of women through research, education, um, and advocacy. And it was really begun 20 years ago, focusing attention on the lack of women and minorities in clinical trials and the fact that all the research, medical research we had up until then was based on young, white, healthy males. We were the first organization that raised the question, how do we know that research done on males is relevant to women? No one had asked that before. Yeah, it seems obvious now, mm. but it wasn't <laughs> no, it two wasn't. decades ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I read that, that you've described the, the view that women were seen as little men, right. but in reality, they are not little men, they are women. And totally are, different. And, and men are men. Where did you learn about this initially? Well, I, I can't take all the credit for that. There was a woman at, at the National Institutes of Health, also uh, Jewish, um, works at the National Institute of Child and Human Development at Florence Hazeltine, came to me, actually put together, was in the process, I think, of putting together a board, really focusing on women's issues 
she at the, at the time was the only OBGYN at that institute, which is supposed to be, but was the only institute really that focused on women's issues, women's health issues. But it turned out that it really focused mostly on pediatric issues. And she was the only OBGYN and was sort of annoyed and frustrated that nobody was looking, and I must say, even to this day, there are some basic women's health issues like endometriosis and fibroids that nobody knows how to treat. You would think by now someone would figure that out. Um, there was just very little attention given to those issues. So she brought a bunch of, um, a group of women together, uh, mostly doctors and researchers whom she had known in, throughout her career. And I, by that time, was at the American Psychiatric Association, and I had gotten very involved in women members of Congress and women's psychiatric issues and women um, psychiatrists. And so somebody told her that I was, you know, I was connected, you know, Bob was in the media, so I had the media, and, and I was on the board of the Democratic National Committee, and, um, um, and then I was very involved in these women's, I was on the ERA America Steering Committee, all that stuff. So she asked me to be on this board. And, and then we, we actually worked with Congress and with the NIH and, um, and found, you know, that women were not being included in, in clinical trials and that um, there really wasn't anybody paying attention. I mean, this was even before breast cancer. There was practically no money to breast cancer. Nobody even said the word breast at that point. Um, I remember the first time, I think it was said in a Packwood hearing, everybody was like, oh, you know. Um, Are we talking about the 1970s? Um, this was in the in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so there was very little funding for, for, for breast cancer or any kind of women's health condition, and there was no distinction at any of the institutes, whether it's the, with the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute or the Institute of Musculoskeletal Issues. There was nobody looking at women and those issues or... Um, you know, women and cardiovascular issues. There was no one that was, everybody was like, well, lumped together, and it was all lumped together based on research on men. Um, we were the first organization five years before the American Heart Association that's, that held a conference looking at sex differences in cardiovascular disease, and now it's like there's, you know, there's differences from beginning to end, from diagnostics to treatment. Um, and then we, um, and then we started focusing. Well, then we were focusing on funding for all these different conditions, uh, and practically all these conditions really disproportionately affect women, with the exception of sort of male only, like testicular cancer, prostate cancer. Otherwise, everything is bladder cancer. It was about the three things I could think of that m m more prevalent in men. Everything else more prevalent in women. Um, and then we actually went to the Institute of Medicine with a proposal to validate the concept of sex differences because, you know, people were just sort of taking what we said, well, you know, who are they? They don't know. We've always done research this way, mm -hmm. you know. It's just some politically correct women's group. Um, but when the Institute of Medicine came out, which I raised the money for that proposal, so it took a number of years to get it going, but finally it came out, they basically unequivocally um, confirmed that sex differences was important. And, and so now, uh, I mean, we're still pushing this because it's far from over, but there's certainly a lot more attention mm -hmm. and information coming out all the time, oh, mostly questions, but um, but there's a lot of attention to it now, so, um, you know, we frankly take credit for that because, mm -hmm. you know, we're you pushing it all yeah. the time. Do you still feel like you're fighting an uphill battle? Yeah. Um, we're doing a poster session at our scientific meeting in June. Um, we did an analysis of the... Um, how many grants were going to sex differences research at the NIH, and uh, uh, assuming that we're slightly off, we see about 5%, which we don't consider very impressive. Do you think things are trending well? Well, I think they are in terms of the realization that this is important, and then than this organization that we just started a few years ago that's international looking at sex differences. But, you know, depending on what happens in Congress and cuts in research, I think we're in big trouble um, because this is not a priority. And you mean m medical research is not a priority? Well, or sex or differences. Or at women. Uh -huh. Well, for many in this Congress, medical research is not a priority, uh -huh. but since sex differences research 
hasn't done that well up until now with decent funding. If they cut it significantly, it can only get worse, I think. So um, uh, you know, there's a lot of consternation and concern about what's going to happen to research, what's going to happen to scientists, young scientists are going to be going into these careers if they can't get funding. Do you find a difference between how the uh, men and women doctors or scientists respond to your group? Yeah, if you're female, you, might, uh, you respond, I mean, it's like, well, why do we know that? Or, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and the other important thing, another, another thing that we do, we have a program to work um, with, with young scientists to, to advance their careers, and we actually give an award each year to a young woman scientist who does research in, in women's health or sex differences. And it's, it's mo more difficult for women scientists to advance in their career because many of them are married and have mm -hmm. child uh, rearing responsibilities along with the other responsibilities that a wife has. And um, so it's more difficult and takes longer for them to publish, do all the things they have to do, you know, get tenure and get, get advancement. So, um, with a cut in funding, um, you know, I think, it, and we find it's not, the A doesn't necessarily exactly equal, you know, B or whatever, but, but more women are interested in looking mm -hmm. at sex differences research because for obvious reasons. Um, and so th this climate of uh, restricting uh, funding for research could really hurt women disproportionately. I think they won't go into research, and then they'll be even slower to get the answers in these areas. When, if, I wonder if you've ever reflected about whether what you do is not only consonant with Jewish values, but uh, a result of Jewish values. And by that, I'm going to explain a little, a little well, bit. Well, I do think I mean, obviously, this, this is a generalization. I do think I, tr I, I do think I'm very aggressive, and won't take no for an answer. And really, um, I mean, like the IOM report. I had a lot of people coming against me, including people at the NIH. And which, I was which report was this? The Institute of Medicine report, which is the scientific arm of the, of the government, independent, but um, it's the government's scientific arm. I mean, I, if I decide that I want to do something, I do it. Now, if that is that a Jewish trait? I don't know. I think to some extent it is. Well, con I think confronting the status quo, um, asking questions, seeking education, yeah. advocating. Yeah. Um, I think if, if, if those are descriptive of, mm -hmm. of uh, Jewish personalities or Jewish women, I'd say I've got them. Um, and I, yeah. and I just, I mean, I always felt that I wanted to, you know, do something, become something. Um, and um, I do think, I, I, I think, you know, who you are is, um, you know, is a combination of how you're brought up, your, your environment, your genetics. And, you know, my environment was Jewish, even though it wasn't, you know, overly religious. Um, and the environment um, and genetics, the zoogenetics. Um, so I think you can't separate. Now, I've, you've won numerous awards for your, your work on behalf of um, the, the research and education that the society um, advocates for. Um, and I, people would consider you a pioneer in this, in this field, a lead, certainly a leader, and you've had an influence on, on medicine, I think. And I was wondering if there's any with that, you know, you're not a boastful person, but how does this recognition of your work make you feel? Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm delighted. I, um, I, I, as I said, I always wanted to have a career. I always wanted to accomplish something. I sort of fell into this in a way. I didn't exactly know where I was going or how it was going to end up. So it's been incredibly rewarding and, and satisfying. And I think. I mean, there's lots of nonprofit organizations, and I work with a lot of them. And I really think that we are one of the few. Now, of course, you know the cancer is so you know they can do a lot more. They can cure, not cure, but certainly treat cancer in a way they couldn't before. We know a lot more about autoimmune diseases than we did before. Same thing with cardiovascular, but 
but have they changed the way research is done? Um, have they, you know, can they sort of go away and say, well, we've accomplished this, we no longer have to have to be around? I, I think the difference with us is we have we've influenced all those organizations to look at sex differences, whether it's autoimmune, cardiovascular, you know, whatever kind of lung cancer. Um, I think we've changed the way research is done. Our international organization is working with other countries, uh, uh, Israel and, and um, some of the European countries on these issues. And I don't think, maybe somebody would have thought of this after me. I don't know, but we'll never know that. So I, you know, I take credit for, um, for changing, the way, uh, changing the way research is done. And I think it's very exciting. My only, my biggest frustration is that we have a terrible time raising money. Um, if you're a disease, you know, ovarian cancer mm -hmm. or breast cancer, that's easy mm -hmm. because, you know, people suffer from it, their family members do, they're afraid they're going to get it. But if you're the Society for Women's Health Research, it's really hard. And foundations, and we talk about this all the time, we just talked about this morning, it's just very hard. They may be interested in global issues, but they don't see this as a global issue, even though it is. Um, so it's, the frustration is we could do a whole lot more, a whole lot faster. We are talking about starting a foundation to start funding our own research to really jumpstart this field because it's gone so slowly. But you know that entails raising a lot of money, and so you know it's sort of I don't know. Um, so what what inspires you to keep to keep fighting this um, you know Goliath? Well, I keep thinking of new big things we need to do. And the foundation's one of them. I've got two big things I want to do. One is starting this foundation, uh, and we're working on it. And I've got some wealthy people who say they might be able to help, and I want to, you know, make I want to get it to a point where they have to at least try. Then I'd like to bring together these centers throughout the country where they're doing um, clinical research. Um, we, they, there once was a consortium under the auspices of Health and Human Services, and they stopped funding them, and they've been sort of disbanded. But the but the the centers still exist, and they periodically call us or contact us to find out if we know what's going on in the other centers and what's the latest research. So what I'd like to do, if I can, is raise the money to bring those together. So those are, I always have to have a new project. Those are my two new projects. I need a lot. I need millions of dollars, um, and I just—I'm not going to give up until, until I reach a point where it's, you know, writing's on the wall, and I have to. And then, and then we're doing a lot of work this year on women veterans' health, um, and I'd like to. A lot of issues out there that are very important, and I've been speaking and working with a lot of veterans groups, um, and so we're hoping again. I need to raise some money, but I think. Um, so the, for me, it gets boring if it's the same old thing. As long as I've got new projects and new ideas, then I'm good. What, do you have advice for the next generation of young women coming up? Well, I think that it's, um, I mean, I think you have to follow your heart. Um, I, I, I still believe in marriage, even though been denigrated to some extent, so many divorces and people are getting married later, which actually is not a bad idea, getting married later. Um, I do think it's possible to, um, to have a career or at least figure out a plan where you can maybe start more slowly um, and then work up to it so that you have um, the benefit of, of the satisfaction of having a rewarding career. But still, spend some of the, you know, certainly the early crucial years with your family. I think that's very important. Um, and you know, lately, I guess Su I saw Susie Osmond. I think that's her name on television the other day on MSNBC. She just wrote a book. I don't know if this is wishful thinking or it's true. That that our values have to change. That it's not. It, it what's not important is the McMansion and having three boats but um, having enough so that you can live comfortably, but having uh, a, uh, you know, a career or a vocation or whatever that, that, that you find fulfilling and satisfying. Maybe going back to the, whether it's doing nonprofit 
or um, foundation or I mean, just just having a career that's a nice career that gives you the living standards that you want, but not thinking that money is the be and the end all of everything, whether it's public service, even government service. I think people now are going into government service, certainly on the Hill, for the wrong reasons. Certainly staff is. Years ago when I was a lobbyist, staff was there forever. You know, you, you worked with people that had been there and that was, what was, that was what their career was. Now it's sort of a jumping off point for making more money someplace else. I think that's sad. If we can come back to the old values, I think that would be easier on women mm -hmm. also. Phyllis, do you see yourself as a role model? I think so. I mean, that's what people say <laughs> when I get interviewed. <laughs> and this magazine, wherever it is. Um, I don't even know if you can buy it on these stands. I've heard of it before. Um, it's called Women of Wealth. And when they first called me, I, I said to them, you know, I don't really have a lot of money. <laughs> um, and they said, but no. you are a woman. It, right. I so you only have one part of that. And they said, no, it's women of, of wealth who have, who have given um, in mentoring and time and achievements. It's not money wealth. Which I thought That's was nice. nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So wh which is more interesting to you, the, the science or the politics? I think the science, well, hmm. it depends how you define politics. If politics means on the hill, I can't bear that stuff anymore. Um, but the politics of, um, of having an idea and pushing all the buttons and talking to all the people and trying to get it off the ground, that's sort of the politics of, of, of achieving what you want to achieve, and not the, poli not the political you know, government because there's politics in everything you do. Um, you have to know, you know who to ask, how to ask it, how to get to the people that you need to get to. So that part of the politics I actually find fun and challenging, and, and that's part of raising money too. Mm -hmm. But the science is exciting. I mean, I'm not a scientist, so, you know, but I hear the presentations. It's, it, it's amazing to work with um, all these young doctors and young researchers and their dedication and they're not making a lot of money that sort of goes back to doing what you believe in and you love and you're interested in um, for posterity really um, it's not about the money it's, um, and a lot of these women physicians especially now economic situation and the practice of medicine has changed so you don't go into medicine to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people do if you're a surgeon, I guess, but, um, but more to, to help people. So, I think so it's I think a question it's of meaning. Meaning, meaning, in, meaning, in, your, meaning in your in your life. life. Yeah. In your, I think that's much more, of, uh, I hope, I hope Susie Oman's right, I don't know. Um, I haven't read the book and, uh, and won't, but um, and maybe that's just an excuse for the fact that people aren't gonna be, except for the, your, the top you know, billionaires, people have to adjust to a more reasonable standard of living and money can't be the um, yardstick by which you measure your success. Um, you know, your yardstick should be your you know, personal satisfaction. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Um, I don't think so. I appreciate being part of this. Um, and, uh, Nice to be recognized, so I appreciate it. It's nice to see you again, too. Thank you, Phil. <laughs>